Second scripture reading today comes from Song of Songs, chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. How graceful are your sandaled feet, willing woman. The smooth curves of your thighs like fine jewelry, the work of an artist's hands. Your navel cupped like the full moon, may it never lack spiced wine. Your belly is a mound of winnowed wheat edged with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle doe. Your neck like a tower of ivory, your eyes, pools, and heshbon by the gate of that lordly city. Your profile is like that of the Tower of Lebanon, looking out toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel and your hair braided in royal purple. A king is bound by the tresses. You are so beautiful, so lovely. My love, excuse me, so lovely, my love, delightful. Don't forget to take a look at the Faith First. It's in your worship folder. It's also on the website now. So if you'd like to carry on the conversation, we begin now. You can also carry it through the week as we take this to God and, and wrestle and struggle with what he would have for us to hear. Last Sunday, we began this series, You Lost Me. And Pastor Aaron did an excellent job sharing the problem that we're facing. The fact that we have a generation now those persons, the millennial generation, that typically are marked by those persons born from 1982 to 2004. It represents around 77 million people, the largest generation ever in our country. And the problem is they seem to be leaving the church in droves, even those who were raised up in the church. The message is based upon the research by David Kinnaman and the Barna Group, and out of that research came two books. One was called Unchristian, which focuses on the millennial generation as a whole. And I think you'll find, if you read that book, the, the, the complaint's a little more hostile than what you find in You Lost Me because it represents those persons raised in the church. At least they know what they're dealing with in those. And in these two books, they help us to see that, and, and this is so important, if you're of my generation or older, we need to realize that this is a new problem. This isn't just the typical people going away off to college and then sowing their oats during their young adult years, and then hopefully they'll come back when they start having children. The world has changed. It is different. And they're not coming back like they used to. The problem is much deeper, and it's not something you're going to solve by offering a, a, a new worship service with some new type of music and technology. It runs much, much deeper. If you missed last Sunday, I invite you to go to the website and look up Pastor Aaron's sermon because he did an excellent job. And I think it's better read than, than her because there's so much in it. And, and re, relearn that. And, and if you even heard it, you might want to do it again because there's so much to grasp, to understand, especially if you're not of the millennial generation. Now, last Sunday, Pastor Aaron mentioned that there's three words that probably help define this generation. It's not true of everybody, but at least it helps define their experience. And those words are access, alienation, and authority. Let me just speak on a couple of those. Access is so critical for us to face because we have to realize this is now a generation that's so plugged in. The smartphones, laptops, iPads, they have information at their fingertips constantly. I mean, as good as the preaching is in this building, <laughs> what are you laughing for? The reality is you can go online and you can find far better preachers and far better sermons. And what's even more important is there are resources that put them in touch with, with sources all over the globe and from other religious perspectives. So when young people come to the church these days, they're not necessarily looking for detailed information. They're looking for wisdom. They're looking for who they, they can listen to. What are the voices they should pay attention to? And realize that they will probably find truth more in community. It'll be found in relationship. And so it changes so many of the things we need to do in the church. It means they're looking for faithful conversations more than they're looking for a good sermon. And the other is authority. 
And because they are now probably the third generation in a row that has experienced a declining trust in institutions of all kinds, after Watergate, Vietnam, after scandals that show up in the news of politicians and of preachers, people don't trust institutions like they used to, even the institution of marriage. And, and so with that authority, it means things have changed. I remember when I had walked into a, a, a restaurant of a small town, there was a certain amount of respect that people had for the pastor because it used to be that pastors were probably one of the most educated persons in the community. But now, because of all that has happened, I make sure I don't tell people I'm a pastor if I walk into a party or someplace. I want them to experience me as a person first to realize then that at least there's somebody they can be themselves with. So access and authority are, are two dramatic issues we need to face. Last Sunday, Pastor Aaron hit on the first two complaints of the six that we're going to share in this series. And he mentioned that there is that need to, to move from overprotection, which has been kind of a characteristic of the parenting of this generation, to discernment. That we need to, to remove those barriers of sacred and secular. That we need to be careful trying to protect our children from everything that is secular and making sure they listen only to Christian music and, and only watch Christian movies. Instead, we need to, to help them discern and see things together, to experience the things in this world together and help decide that which is certainly of God and reflects the character of Jesus and to discern things that maybe we should be called to be countercultural for. And he also spoke about the need to share a real and powerful and genuine faith. That we've had this tendency, uh, it's been described that the faith that's been given this millennial generation is moralistic, therapeutic deism, where God's just not all that involved. He's just kind of this friendly uh, grandparent up there. And that we need to introduce them to the risk and the challenge of the Christian faith. Our Lord is one who died on a cross, and his followers immediately thereafter died as martyrs. There should be a risk, an adventure, a challenge to our faith. If we don't live out that challenge and demonstrate it, then what kind of faith are we giving our children and our grandchildren? And if they don't find that adventure here, they will look for it elsewhere, and they already are. Now, two things that for us to consider is to be appreciative of the disconnect that we've experienced. I'd like to show a little video here that uh, is a person on the street kind of video and, and look for the contrast. The first part will be asking people what they think of Jesus and then I'll ask them what they think of Christians. Good guy. Um, love, compassion, um, diversity. An Easter, loving, bearded, kind. He's got a good op opinion of Jesus Christ, that's for sure. An excellent man, wonderful. Sure, they've had every religion after him. My savior. Actually, Jesus was the first punk rocker. Yeah? Yeah. He's, he's pretty cool, and I like him a lot. Savior. Black. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Yeah, I think it's good. Because like it's, <laughs> it's Jesus. What else would you think of? I'm um, definitely um, altruistic philanthropy. Loving, peaceful, sincere. Out of touch. Uh, hopeful. Yeah. On their part, they're hoping for something they're not going to uh, get. I believe. Um, psycho, uneducated, backward, the South. I think of somebody that's possibly just a little bit, um, a little bit overboard, a little bit extreme. My Uncle Bob, um, conservative, white. Fanatical. Oh, okay. Bible thumpers. Crazy. <laughs> People who wear white and, like, kind of glow, but are kind of freaky. Okay. Yeah, and, um... Texas? I think I think there's a lot of stig stigma attached to that word. 
I can't answer that. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. Frightening. Yeah. Yeah. And just the overpowering. overpowering. Yeah. You don't want to know. Somewhat scary. Um, maybe a little rigid in their in their dogma and their philosophy. Oh, um, nothing too good. Now, I'm, am I glowing? Am I glowing? That, do you see what we're up against? You see the challenges that we're facing? And part of the reason Pastor and I, Aaron and I really want to do this series is because we feel like the complaints that we're sharing from the millennial generation have some validity to them. And we, we hope, we, our desire is that by sharing it, it will call all of us to think about are we truly living out the authentic faith, the faith that gave, was given to us by Jesus. Now today I want to focus on two more of the complaints. And the first one is the focus on the concern that Christians, at least the vocal ones, are anti-science. That there's this, this competition that seems to take place between faith and religion, and you can't seem to have your feet in both. And people seem, especially those in the millennial generation, believe that they're having to choose one or the other. Uh, as we wrestle with this, I think it's important to realize that we have a lot of competing voices. At least young people today do. They open their textbook and it shares one, one view and one theory, and then they may go to church and they hear someone preach that you can't believe in evolution and the Bible at the same time. They'll watch YouTube videos. They turn on the TV and they've got channels like like the Science Channel and National Geographic and, uh, and the Planet uh, Channel and all those animal planet and it helps them begin to think that they're experts in science and a lot of scientists almost have become uh, pop icons and so there's this divide David Kinnaman in his book You Lost Me says to the extent to which we in the Christian community insist that young adults should just accept our right answers, we perpetuate a needless schism between science and faith. And it's not really necessary to have that schism. The challenge is that we often misuse the Bible, both Christians and atheists, and they try to make it something it's not intended to be. A book whose primary job is to talk about God and talk about humanity and our relationship between the two often gets pulled out of context and used in ways it was not intended. A good example, turn to Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. It speaks about the four corners of the earth. It's mentioned in other places in Revelation. And I've actually seen atheists who pull that out and say, see, the Bible's wrong. It's, it thinks the earth is flat. Now, critical thinking Christians thoughtful Christians understand that in Bible times there was a worldview that they had that doesn't always compare to what we know and understand about science. That doesn't mean what they share is not true. It just means that their language, which is expressive language, isn't always trying to share scientific truth. It's trying to share theological truth. And this passage is obviously one trying to say that God reaches out to the ends of the earth. It's not trying to say the earth is flat. And so those challenges make it very complicated. And reality is the Bible doesn't try to answer every problem that we experience in this world, especially scientific. Often the Bible tries to leave this creative tension. You read the book of Job, and it deals with the issue of evil, but it doesn't explain it. It leaves us with that tension to wrestle with. Our passage that we heard from Psalm earlier in the service, talks about the mystery of God. The story of the prodigal son is shared with us to help us identify and ask ourselves, who are we like? The story of Adam Eve is the same. They're not trying to suggest that there was just two people. It's trying to say that we are so much like Adam and Eve. So let's let the Bible be what it was intended to be. And that schism doesn't need to be there. Because the reality is, if you look at the history of faith, 
Science and faith have often walked side by side. As a matter of fact, I'd suggest if you know your history well, you'd realize that the Renaissance was inspired by the Christian faith. It was Christian thinkers who were motivated by the order in the universe they found. As they read the creation story, they went to try to discover that order. You might not realize that the largest source of scientific study before the French Revolution was the Catholic Church. The Jesuit order was the greatest producer of, of writings, scientific, and of discoveries in Europe, all of Europe in medieval times. Galileo is a good example. Many times Galileo has been used to show of that, that competition between faith and science. But you know, Galileo never lost his faith. He was challenged early by the hierarchy of the church, but he didn't give up that faith. He continued to fight it. And while he was, for a time, considered a heretic, eventually his discoveries were affirmed and he was received. And what you realize is that co the conflicts there is not between religion and faith. It was about hierarchies and politics and individual personalities. Galileo said, mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. And he also said, while the Bible teaches men how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Sir William Bragg in 1915 was given the uh, Nobel Prize in the area of physics for his work on x-rays. And one time he remarked that people have asked me if there is an opposition between faith and science, between religion and science, they said yes. There's the same opposition as the thumb is to the fingers, and it takes both in order to grasp the realities of life. There does not need to be a competition between science and religion. As a matter of fact, since religion is being taken out of the schools, the church should now become that place where people can bring their inquiries, their questions, and wrestle with things, science and otherwise, in the church. And the second complaint is that the church is repressive, especially in matters of sexuality. And I think if we're honest, we'll have to admit that there's this elephant in the room. And the elephant is that for many years we have lifted up the scriptural passages that focus on sexual fidelity. But if we're honest, we'd realize that very rarely, maybe not at all, does the Bible define what that fidelity looks like. And the reality is, even though we have suggested and taught in the church many, many years that, that sexuality needs to be reserved for the context of marriage, the fact is that a recent study showed that four out of five evangelicals between the ages of 18 and 29 have had sex before marriage. This is evangelicals, people, people raised in that kind of repressive environment. I remember early on in my ministry when I do premarital counseling, you have that sex talk, you know? And I would say, if. Now I say, when. And I don't think any amount of strict preaching is going to change that reality. So we need to learn to, to focus and let people bring their questions and their challenges. And you, when you look at the biblical witness, if we're honest with ourselves, it's rather complicated. You got Abraham who takes his wife Sarah and passes her off as his sister, and she's taken into the harem of the king because he was afraid to own up to being her husband, afraid it might cost him his life. You've got Lot offering his virgin daughters to these neighbors knocking on his door, trying to take advantage of the strangers he had in his home. You have the story of Tamar who had to resort to being a prostitute in order to receive the seed she needed from her father-in-law because her husband had died and he had not owned up to the responsibility the Jewish law required. You got the stories of Jacob and Isaac who had many wives. Matter of fact, those wives were what produced the 12 tribes of Israel. You have the Jewish law that, that allowed for a man to easily divorce his wife without cause. And a woman had no right whatsoever. And then you got the Song of Songs, which you pretty much got to rate PG-13, right, that we heard today? 
And we've never known what to do with that book in the Bible, but it is in the Bible. If nothing else, it suggests to us that God understands how powerful our sexual passions are and that there is a connection between our sexuality and our spirituality. If nothing else, all of this suggests to us that the Bible is complicated when it comes to our sexuality and how important it is that we affirm that and recognize that and acknowledge that humanity has struggled with with the sin of their bodies and the failures of living that out faithfully for centuries. So what can we offer our young people? What can we say to millennials about the subject of sexuality? We don't need to just punt it. I believe we need to share the ethic of Jesus. Jesus offers us some very powerful images to help us understand. First of all, we got that story of the woman who committed adultery. Remember how she was drugged before him? The authorities thought they had Jesus. They were going to put him in a bind between his compassion and the rightness of the law. And how did Jesus get out of that? All those men that had stones. And, and did you take note, where is the man in this story? Right? It takes two, right, to commit adultery? And no man to be found, which shows all that is wrong with the religious authorities of that time. And with the stones in their hands, wouldn't you love to be there and watch as Jesus said, he who is without sin, let him be the first to throw the stone. And one by one, watch them drop their rocks and walk away. And then Jesus says to the woman, go and sin no more. Jesus had that perfect combination and balance of accountability and compassion. And we can learn a lot from that as a church. And then there's this passage in Matthew 19 that is a beautiful passage. It is what we need to be sharing and just simply offering it to the millennial generation and say, wrestle with this, struggle with this. Jesus answered, haven't you read that at the beginning the creator made them male and female? And God said, because of this, a man should leave his father and mother and be joined together with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The two will become one. Isn't that beautiful? And it says so much. And we can let it speak for itself because it tells us that, that there needs to be an understanding that sex is never just sex, that there's this connection between our bodies and our spirits, and there's the connection whenever you connect your body with someone else's body, there's a connection of your spirits. And to deny that is to deny who you are and how God created you. And so we encourage people to wrestle with it. David Kinnaman says it well. Sex is about self selflessness, not primarily about self. It is about serving, not only about personal pleasure. It is about God's creativity intersecting human action, not our personal identity and self-expression. Rather than saying that sex is taboo or that sex is about me, the relational approach says sex is good and it is about us together. There's a lot that can be shared. And I'd suggest to you this issue, like so many of the issues that, that the millennials are complaining about and wrestling with, is how we need to share it. To let them know that this place will be a safe place to bring their questions without judgment, to dialogue and connect our faith resources so that they can sort out for themselves how they want to conduct their lives I think that's what millennials are calling for and asking the church to be. Let me let Aaron share his thought. Well, I'm sure some of you like to be the center of attention at parties. Um, I tend to be somebody who likes to be on the edges of parties uh, because I've found that that's where uh, the better conversations usually happen. And um, as I'm sure you can, you can probably imagine, pastors are hot items at, par at parties. Um, we get lots of invitations because we're known as being really fun-loving people. Um, I'm the funniest person I know. Um, <clears throat> and like Jerry, I don't usually tell people when I get to parties that I'm a pastor. Uh, if somebody happens to find out early in a party, my wife will usually say, but he's not that kind of pastor. 
but once people find out, and I've kind of been hanging out with them on the edges after they apologize for a few off-color things they've said, which is another thing. I don't know why everybody does that, but anyway, they do. Um, and then they usually tell me why they haven't been to church for a while, and, you know, <laughs> happens at Kroger sometimes, too. But anyway, um, but once they find out I'm a pastor and I'm not that kind of pastor and I'll actually listen to them, they start sharing things that are kind of interesting to me. And some of the things that people share, have shared fairly recently with was, one person told me, I can't believe, or I can't be a Christian because I don't believe in the virgin birth. Or another person said, I can't be a Christian because I believe the geolo geological record is more accurate than the creation museum folks who say the earth is only 6,000 to 10,000 years old. Do you really think that God would just make rocks look 4.5 billion years old? Doesn't God really have anything better to do? Or do I really need to get married today? I'm deeply committed to my partner. Isn't that really what matters? Or why does the church not let all people who are in committed relationships and desire to be married actually get married? And questions like these are difficult for us. Uh, they can become conversation killers and deepen divisions if we answer uh, quickly or don't answer at all. Or they can become opportunities for deep listening and um, honest conversation. Um, that's what usually happens when people say things to me and I don't react in the way that they expect. I love doing that, first of all, because people think they're going to shock me with what they say. Uh, or they say, well, I'm an atheist, you know, and I, okay, yes. Um, and then usually by the end I tell them, and God loves you anyway, and there's nothing you can do about it. But, um, <laughs> which is true. But I do that in a joking way. But because I'm open to conversations and I don't jump down their throat or give them an easy answer right off the bat, um, you kind of dig and you kind of hear where um, they're coming from. The way we respond as Christians is almost as important as anything that we say. For example, um, the virgin birth, for instance, is not a deal breaker for me. Uh, you know, my faith is not dependent on how Jesus was conceived. And I think that if that is the only roadblock that someone has to having faith in Jesus, that we need to just say, you know what, it, that's really not the cornerstone of our faith. And explain a little bit about the person of Jesus instead of, you know, talking about his birth. Or, um, you know, even though I believe it to be true, um, it's not something that I'm willing uh, to risk someone else's life over and, and keep them from something that can be uh, something great. Or perhaps you believe um, very strongly in Christian marriage. Then I think you're, you need to let people know how marriage has enabled your love to grow and has enriched your life with the person who you love. You know, people can often not imagine what they don't see and if our signs of life in our marriages aren't visible to those around us uh, people notice and they wonder if maybe there's a better way we need to talk about and live out our faith in marriage matters uh, because those around us are watching and they are wondering and if you think differently than someone else, um, be honest about how you came to the place where you um, are on a particular topic or issue. Share your experiences and listen to the experiences of others, too. And above all else, be gracious and loving just as Jesus has been gracious and loving to you. And especially be that way with people who disagree with you. Retired United Methodist Bishop Will Willimon once was talking to a rabbi, and he said, One of us is wrong. Jesus is either the Messiah or he is not. Those are the two choices. He is or he is not. 
However, the God who I believe in, and I think that you believe in too, I hope will be gracious with all of us who are faithfully seeking him. I hope that we all can be that gracious. Um, because people, whether they agree with you or disagree with you, or inside of the church or outside of the church, a lot of times they are seeking after God too. Um, and they just need a little bit of help uh, to find him. May God work toward Christ-like grace in all of our interactions to the glory of God. Lord, we ask that you put a blessing upon this congregation, wherever we may gather, that it can become a safe place for every generation, that they can bring their questions, their doubts, their struggles, and find the connections to our resources and the faith that can truly change and transform their lives. But as we go out into the world, let us be humble, not professing to have all the answers, but at least having some answers that have meant something to us and be willing to share those faithfully when and how they need to be heard. This we ask in the name of your Son, who is our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.